Okay then, you guys asked for it, so here it is. Who is Pandora's actor? Who would have thought that a Nazi-based character with a bowling ball for a head would be the most popular out of all the Nazarick oh. NPCs? Let's see what all the hype is about. As per usual, we'll start with his creation and backstory. Then next episode, we'll get more into his build and abilities. A quick side note though, I'm very excited to share that we've launched a brand new design in the Overlord Annie News Apparel, the new Albedo Succubae shirts, which are now available through the link in the description. Now, let's begin. I suppose that the most logical place to start would be with Ainz's personal life, back when he was just the player known as Momonga. After all, Pandora's actor was created by Suzuki Satoru. This salary man had spent most of his life as a loner. He didn't really have any friends in school, and that didn't change much when he joined the workforce either. He was quiet, shy, and not particularly opinionated or assertive. So nobody really went out of their way to interact with him in return. You could say that he languished in isolation. It's a fairly par for the course description of your typical isekai protagonist. But this isolated lifestyle would eventually change as he played Yggdrasil more. Starting from his first encounter with Touch Me when the man rescued him from a large group of PKers that were hunting heteromorphs. You could say he was Momonga's literal knight in shining armor. So Touch Me being one of the first people to willfully interact with Momonga, birthed the formation of a strong bond between the two. He had a fairly honest, benevolent, and welcoming nature that would pretty much make friends with anyone, whereas Momonga was just desperate for someone to relate with. After this, I guess, fateful encounter, they would soon meet and interact with many other heteromorphic players, and they would go on to establish a guild called Nine's Own Goal under Touch Me's leadership. Through this, Ainz would discover what it was like to have a group of close friends for the first time. Each member had their own perspectives, ideals, and opinions, and they had no problem sharing them. Momonga, not having a strong opinion of his own, didn't really have a passion to speak of, and he wasn't confident enough in his own ideas. Thus, he absorbed the passions and ideas of others like a sponge. Because of this lack of social skills, he became content with just watching from the sidelines as everyone else interacted. But that's not to say that they ignored him. No, he became a trusted member of the guild, and a close friend to basically everyone. Perhaps it was his quiet nature that molded him into a good listener that made guild members come to him with their own frustrations and personal problems. Regardless of the reason though, he found himself in a position where he was trusted to hear out disagreements and serve as this neutral mediator. One such disagreements between Touch Me and Ulbert resulted in the guild being reformed to Ainz Ulgon with Momonga as the leader, mostly due to the mutual respect that each of the founding members had for him. This led the guild into its golden era, where at its peak, they had 41 dedicated members that helped to maintain the guild's place in the top 10 rankings of Yggdrasil, and they would create what was reportedly known as the unconquerable guild base of Nazarick. Momonga being the leader was the glue that held all this together. However, it was at some point that real life obligations prevented the guild members from spending as much time with the guild as they used to. Real life took over, and members began to drift away from their hardcore gaming lifestyles and became more casual players so that they could focus on the important things in their life, like their families or moving up the corporate ladder. Soon enough, members began to leave the guild one by one, usually handing over their inventory to the treasury or Momonga in the process. Momonga had expected this, but he still couldn't accept the pain in his heart of losing his dear friends. He held out hope that maybe one day at least some would return. But when the membership finally dwindled to nothing, he was despondent. He decided to go into full carry mode and grind as much gold and loot as possible just to try to keep the guild's finances afloat. Maintenance costs for a top 10 guild was certainly not a cheap endeavor. Also, out of nostalgia, he created golems with the appearance of guildmates to guard the treasures, each adorned with the gear of the members that they were likened to. It was this fondness of the good times that he had with his guildmates that would later become basically his only motivation in the new world. He protects and adores the NPCs because they remind him of his guildmates. He acts for the benefits of Nazarick because it was created by his guildmates. He crushes anyone who tries to use his guildmates' names against him. And it was this appreciation for his friends that motivated him to create his first and only NPC, the Guardian of the Treasury, Pandora's Actor. Let's talk a bit of history now. In Greek mythology, Pandora was the first woman to ever be created. The TLDR is that the Titan Prometheus had just stolen fire from Mount Olympus and gave it to humanity. Zeus decided to punish humanity by giving them their first woman, Pandora. She was presented as a gift to Epimetheus, Prometheus' brother, who even though was warned not to take any gifts from the gods, still took her anyway and married her. 
She carried with her a jar, or box, which was also a gift from the gods, but she was unaware of its contents. Then when curiosity got the best of her, instead of killing the cat, it just unleashed every known evil upon mankind. Yep, Zeus's grand punishment was a woman carrying all the evils to ever exist. <laughs> Am I the only one that finds it a little bit funny that this story basically names woman as the harbinger of all things evil? But setting the low-key misogyny of the ancient Greeks aside, Pandora's story is important because of the meaning that the phrase Pandora's box took on as a result of this myth. Later literary and artistic treatments of the mythology focused less on the woman herself and more on the nature of the evil that was unleashed. In some cases, the person to open the box was said to even be a man who was too curious for his own good. Nowadays, a Pandora's box is a gift that at first appears to be valuable, but is quickly revealed to be a disaster or curse. And to open up a Pandora's box is to unleash something chaotic, unpredictable, and usually disastrous. That said, the evil inside the Pandora's box is sometimes downplayed. And the emphasis is on the fact that many different, unique things burst forth. The contents of Pandora's box could be the embodiment of diversity, chaos, and change, which, while often harmful, can still have an unexpectedly benign or positive outcome as well. It's not that change and diversity are necessarily bad, it's that they are unpredictable and therefore risky. Pandora's actor is a reflection of this motif. Much like how Pandora's box is a container of wildly diverse, unpredictable, and oftentimes downright evil things, Pandora's actor is someone who acts as or imitates a diverse array of evil creatures. It's a very creative use of the Pandora name to really nail everything that this NPC embodies. He's a part of the doppelganger race, and Eins created him specifically so that he could transform into and imitate the capabilities and appearance of every single one of the guild members. But since the guild members liked the idea of roleplaying as evil villains in the form of these very terrifying creatures, the guild itself could then be seen as a Pandora's box in its own right. Or at least that's what they'd like to be. Pandora's actor can then be seen as both this metaphorical and physical love letter to the guild and its members, an expression of the appreciation that Ainz had for all the time that he spent together with them. Of course, the other NPCs are extremely jealous of Pandora's actor, since he is the only creation of their supreme ruler. As for his design, Ainz actually didn't really have anything cohesive in mind. Whether the final result was intentional or accidental is a bit of a mystery. You see, Ainz is a very impulsive, lateral thinker meaning his mind likes to jump from one topic to the other in rapid succession, and he can sometimes confuse himself in the process. Pandora's personality was constructed in much the same manner, a collection of a random assortment of ideas based on how Ainz was feeling at the time. His intentions weren't really for the creation of some meticulously planned and masterfully crafted NPC. Of course, the underlying theme for Pandora's actor does relate very strongly to the Greek myth that the name derives from, so it is very possible that there was always this constant underthought. Unfortunately though, the random ideas that Ainz had while making Pandora ended up coming back to bite him, as he found his creation quite embarrassing and ridiculous when he met him for the first time. It's because, just like Tabula, Ainz also went through a bit of a Chunibu phase earlier in his life. Chunibu, or 8th grader syndrome, is a phase that frequently strikes kids approximately in the 8th grade, where they become obsessed with certain imagery and behavior that they consider cool. The obsession becomes so strong that they often feel the desire to emulate or pretend that they themselves are a part of what they're obsessing over. It could be thinking that you have hidden powers, dressing like you're from your favorite show, or even acting all edgy because you think that you have an over-the-top tragic backstory like Sasuke. It is, however, still just a phase, and it ends almost as soon as it begins and the person in question looks back on it with feelings of embarrassment. So what exactly was it that Ainz obsessed over during this short-lived phase? Well, if you're an SJW, then prepare to be triggered, because in a word, it was Nazis. Now just wait a second, before you go get your pitchforks and say boycott Overlord because Ainz is a fucking Nazi, let's just calm down for a second and let me try to explain this. Alright, so I'm not exactly a history buff, but there's a bit of a thing that Japan has for Germany and Nazi imagery. And if we're pointing this out, I might as well point out that other Asian countries such as Taiwan, South Korea, and Indonesia do this as well. But don't go pointing your pitchforks at these countries yet either. To be fair, it's partly due to the fact that their education on World War II mostly focused on their relevance and impact that it had on the East instead of the Holocaust or Nazi Germany in general. At least that's the way it was until you reached university. That's a very long time to go without being explicitly told about certain key historical events. 
So allow me to give you a quick refresher. Japan and Germany were allies during World War II. At the end of the war, while North America and Europe were dealing with the fallout of the Nazi death camps and then the rising tide of communism to the east, Japan was dealing with both the literal and metaphorical fallout of being hit by two nuclear bombs. Not only were they isolated from the atrocities committed by their allies, they were also undergoing cultural turmoil as a result of the massive loss of life. Three things happened culturally as a result of this. First, they went from extremely imperialistic and nationalistic to extremely pacifistic and somewhat libertarian and capitalistic. Second, they began to imitate the culture of the nation that beat them so heavily in the war. In this case, it was America. Thirdly, they retained a low-key sense of wonderment and appreciation for their allies, Germany, who single-handedly almost conquered all of Europe and was only brought down by a three-way alliance between the world's number one powers at the time. Of course, different people and groups in Japan reacted in different ways. I'm not saying that these three things were dominant trends that took over all of Japan, nor were they the only things that happened as a result of the war. I'm just saying that these three things that did emerge are relevant to this explanation. So what I'm trying to say is that whereas the rest of the planet mostly remembers Nazi Germany for their World War II atrocities, Japan retains this impression of Germany and America too as these straight up badasses. And there's remnants of this fascination all throughout the anime culture. Like, why is the title to Girls on Panzer half English and half German? Why use the German word for tank instead of the Japanese word? Or why are there so many blonde haired blue eyed foreign girls in anime? These are things that are different from ordinary Japanese culture, and things that are different are sometimes seen as exotic and cool. Especially given how stiflingly secular Japanese traditionalism can be to many young people. But there are also even more on the nose examples. Now in this next one, I'm not saying that Lelouch is Hitler, he's my favorite character in any show, but Lelouch's rise to power in Code Geass could be seen as an analogy to Hitler's. Yeah, their motivations and actions were different, but the underlying methods of how they rose to the spot of tyrannical dictator could be seen as similar. Then for the blatantly obvious example, some people in Asia openly cosplay as Nazis, though in Japan it's a bit less common since adults tend to understand that it's culturally unacceptable. So yes, Pandora's actor's mannerisms are styled after a Nazi general, replete with a World War II era German SS officer trench coat. He even speaks a lot of German too, and tends to frequently be over the top and exaggerated with his behaviors. Eins had thought that at the time, military uniforms were quite stylish and cool looking. He even decided that because Pandora's actor was supposed to be an actor, it would make sense for him to be very over the top and dramatic in his mannerisms. Unfortunately, Eins could have never anticipated the fact that the random ideas that popped into his head about Pandora's actor's personality and appearance would ever come back to haunt him. As I'm sure you're well aware of now, the current Eins finds Pandora's actor to be terribly embarrassing and is very self-conscious of the fact that his guildmates might mock him for his creation. However, what you may not know is that his outward appearance, as ridiculous as it may be, is really just a sham. After all, he is an actor. His intelligence is said to rival that of Albedo and Demiurge. And although it's never specified precisely how his talents relate to theirs, he's said to have a very strange thought process. Just like Eins, he's a lateral thinker who can see things from a variety of unusual perspectives, and thus he's quite good at picking up on things others fail to notice. But he often puts on a show of being dramatically surprised about things or being extremely passionate, not because he actually is, but it's because he was written to over-exaggerate everything that he does. He is also one of the only NPCs who openly questions Eins' orders. It's not because he's disloyal. In fact, of all the NPCs in Nazarick, he's probably the most loyal to Eins, since most NPCs will choose to follow the orders of their creator over that of the remaining Supreme One. He questions Eins' orders in order to understand what he's thinking and why he does things, so that he himself can carry out the orders better. As such, his relationship with Eins is very relaxed, cordial, and impersonal and he takes liberties that other guardians wouldn't dare to. The respect and adoration towards a supreme being is still there, but Eins finds it tough to maintain his commanding overlord persona when with Pandora's actor. Eins frequently uses the analogy that the NPCs are the children of their creators, and it's not just illustrative either, that's actually how he views them. They each have various personality quirks that are reminiscent of the guild members that he once spent so much time with. When Pandora hears this, he takes to this label wholeheartedly and starts calling Ayn's father. It's often theorized that Pandora's actor is the only person in Nazarick who really understands Ayn's. 
He seems to be somewhat aware of the fact that Ainz finds the expectations that are placed upon him by the rest of the servants to be stifling and stressful, and so perhaps he chooses to take a more relaxed approach because of this. Pandora's actor, just like all the other NPCs, take after their creators in many ways that aren't specified in their lore or backstory. So perhaps deep down inside, beneath the mask and his acting, Pandora's actor feels the same way that Ainz does. A lonely soul that's desperate for a friend to truly connect with. And just maybe this is the reason why he's able to understand Ainz the best, and why he can be so informal in his presence. Now, normally I'd put his responsibilities as an area guardian in the next video. But his role in Nazarick plays a lot into his lore, so let's talk a bit about it now. As I said in the beginning of the video, Pandora's actor is the area guardian of the treasury, the place where all the guild members' equipment are enshrined, and they sit as a testament to all the guild's glory and accomplishments. Area guardians are not to be confused with floor guardians. Just as the name implies, floor guardians are in charge of an entire floor, whereas area guardians are given dominion over a specific area within a floor. Normally, area guardians are the lesser powerful of the two, but that's not always the case as there are plenty other NPCs within Nazarick that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with floor guardians given the right circumstances. Alongside his role as an area guardian, Pandora's actor was also written to be the treasurer with a mindset of being absolutely obsessed with cataloging and categorizing all of the magical items within it. He also just loves handling magical items in general, looking at them, admiring them, polishing the armor, sharpening the weapons, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, it only makes sense that someone who spends all day sitting around in the treasury should be doing so because they actually enjoy it. From this, Pandora's actor knows everything about every item in the treasury, including its capabilities, how best to use them, what they are worth, and so on. He's also generally responsible for any sequence involving finances of the treasury. Presumably, he works alongside Albedo to ensure that Nazarick's finances and expenses are kept in good standing but his more regular duties entailed preparing the money necessary for operating and controlling Nazarick's defense networks. However, after arriving in the New World, out of the fear that Nazarick's finite supply of gold would be exhausted, Ainz had ordered the bulk of the defense network to be shut down, so he generally doesn't have that much to do. Given Ainz's efforts to make Pandora's actor capable of imitating the appearance and capabilities of every one of the guild members, he could very much reliably fill the shoes of almost any guardian, and would make an excellent and versatile servant. But because of Ainz's embarrassment, he remains locked in the treasury. Fortunately, since no guardians had permission to enter, or would dare to do so behind Ainz's back, and almost no other guardian knew of his existence, Ainz could just pretend that he didn't exist for a while. But eventually, once word of Pandora's actors spread to Demiurge and the other guardians, they began to recommend that Ainz make more use of his abilities, which we'll get more into in the next episode. But yeah, that's the backstory of Pandora's actor. This time around, there wasn't too much context regarding the NPC himself, so instead, Jinfor and I decided to focus on Ainz's reasoning behind his creation. But anyway, before I go, don't forget to check out the new Albedo Succubay shirts or the Nazarick Emblem ones at teespring.com backslash stores backslash Annie News, or just click the link in the description. It really does help support what we do here. And I really couldn't be any more happy with the way that Bakuretsu was able to make the albedo design work out. He spent a monumental amount of time putting this one together. So a huge shout out to him and a huge thank you for all the work that he's done. Speaking of which, I'm actually going to hop off the script here. So recently we hit 100,000 subscribers and honestly, I really just need to thank you guys for that because... I didn't do a 50,000 special, I didn't do a 10,000 special, I don't really do specials because I honestly don't think I have enough time to, to like even know what I'll do during one of those videos, but I think I should just say thank you to everyone who's been watching my videos from the beginning or if you just started checking them out, but honestly the support is always amazing to have on this channel. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you guys so much for watching everything that I put out. It really does mean a lot to me. Anyway. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!